Hi, it's Phil Kerner, the Tool and Die Guy, broadcasting from the studio here in Erie, Pennsylvania tonight. You're in for a real treat with this lesson. Uh, this is actually uh, a webinar I did a few years ago called 50 Kick-Ass Ways to Do Your Work Faster Than Ever. So what you're going to see here are uh, at least 50 things that I use on a daily basis to get my work done fast and accurately. Uh, I have a, a saying, okay, and my saying is, anybody can do anything if you give them way too long to do it all right one of the major re reasons i still have my job today is my ability to get things done quickly and accurately okay so enjoy this like i said it's about an hour long and uh, this is how it works for me i'm sure it might work a little differently for you there will be other opinions i get it but this is how i do it okay it's a starting point and if you're new to this trade or setting up your hobby shop you'll learn a lot from this if you've been around for a while there'll be a few aha moments and maybe you're just an older guy who just like watching videos and you'll just like looking at the tools, right? So I hope you enjoy it. Again, I'm Phil Kerner, the Tool and Die Guy. I want to also note uh, what you're going to see tonight. None of this is rocket science, okay? Um, some of it might be fairly obvious. And, you know, I used to think that too. And I work with a lot of smart guys where I work with at, at, at now. And I go into a lot of different shops. I'm always amazed at the things they could do to improve. The problem is, as I think you all know, uh, setting up an efficient work area. And I'm not Mr. Lean, okay? But I, I get what Lean's all about, the process, Lean process. But you know, sometimes it gets messier and messier and people start hoarding this and that, and all of a sudden you've got this mess and now you're overwhelmed and don't know what to do with it. So if you keep up with it, it, it it's a lot easier. And I think people just get used to looking at their own messes sometimes and it's just the way they do work. But I've always had this theory, you really can't do precision work in a messy work area. So again, what you're going to see tonight is the culmination of at least eight years of where I've been uh, at working now, but it's 40 years of training too. So you might not be able to implement everything you're going to learn tonight immediately. But again, you'll have this video as a reference and you'll probably see ways you can improve on this, the things I do. Uh, again, there's, so there's not one big thing you're going to learn tonight. It's a whole bunch of little things that go in together to make this system uh, work for me every day. And I should add, the real reason I have a job where I work today, and I'll let you know a little secret, I am not the world's greatest machinist. I was an excellent tool maker and mold maker, but going in the machining world was a little different for me. So what I had to learn was to be a better machinist and we're an ISO company, ISO 9002 certified. So we have the standards and everything. But I do many more setups than I used to. You know, as a mold maker, I might throw a block of steel on a, on a machine for a week or two. And now I do up to eight setups a day. So again, all this adds up. So um, a little bit about me to get started. So I completed my four-year tool and die apprenticeship here in Erie, Pennsylvania. I think I finished in 1981. So I am a certified journeyman tool and die maker here in Pennsylvania. Uh, I was the founder and CEO of, the, of my own tool and die company, Current Tool and Die Incorporated. I founded and I was the CEO of my own small plaxis company. And I'm currently a tool maker, prototype specialty machinist right here in Erie, Pennsylvania at the Industrial Sales and Manufacturing. I'm also the apprentice apprenticeship supervisor at industrial sales and I founded the tool and die guy dot com way back in 2012 that's what brings us all together tonight so here we go start with my work area what you're gonna see tonight is I'm not going to talk a lot about my hand tools and we can do it uh, I'd be glad to teach a class on it because I've got a lot of really cool tools and the reason I have a lot of cool tools is when I uh, was a tool maker, a mold maker. Um, we didn't have inspection departments. Now the place I work at now has a very large inspection department and they have a lot of measuring tools. As a mold maker, I didn't have an inspection department. So if I wanted to measure something, I had to have my own tools because you got yelled at if you can borrow the same guy's tools, right? So I've got quite a collection of tools, but that's not what this is going to be about tonight. But the reality is if you ever want me to teach a class on all the cool stuff I have, that might be a lot of fun. So let's take a little walk around this work area. Uh, to my right here, I hope you can see my mouse, that is a Mazak a vertical machining center. And I love Mazaks. Now, the purists don't love Mazaks. I get it. The G-code guys, you know, the Mazaks are a little bit beneath them. And I get that, even though you can manually program a Mazak. For a tool maker like myself, uh, Mazaks were wonderful machines to learn because I didn't have to learn G-code. So 
uh, back in the 80s, when we the place I worked at before I started my own shop, they decided to start buying Mazaks. And I was so disgruntled when they put me on a Mazak. I was a Hydrotel guy. And uh, it took me about three weeks to figure it out. I thought this was pretty cool. And uh, luckily, the place I went to work at after I closed my shops, they're Mazak happy too. So it was a perfect storm for me. And they, they're just so easy to program. So it lets me focus more on being creative with my uh, setups and tooling and not worry about G code programming. For me, it works. And I, I can tell you that if you give me a good guy and a decent machine, I can have somebody who's never run a CNC uh, uh, running in two weeks on a Mazak and, and be 90% there. So I'm a big proponent of Mazaks. They should pay me for this ad. So my work area again. So we start with the Mazak. In the foreground here, I would call this my deburring bench. And we'll go over a few things. You see, I've got a couple of uh, drill chucks there. And uh, I've actually got a piece of rubber matting on there to keep my parts from getting nicked up. I'm a, I'm a big believer in when people are paying for parts, they shouldn't have scratches all over them. So you know, I've got a little deburring section there, a little drill press in the corner. For I use that once in a while to put counter sinks or something in. But this is my main bench here. This is where I, I sit. And there's my laptop. And of course, you guys have followed me for a while. You know, I'm big on my toolboxes and the Gerstner toolbox and everything. But uh, we'll turn this around in a second. And I've got a cart here with a surface plate on it. And the reason that's on wheels is once in a while, uh, when we have really large work come in, I have to push that out of the way. And it's a lot easier than picking up the surface plate. Now, if we just turn around, same work area. Uh, that's besides my Gerstner box. Those are my three main workhorses here. Um, I've got a, a Kennedy. A large candidate about that about so oh boy 1988 bought the base i think in the same year and that was actually my brother's he gave me that in uh, about 1980 and he think i think he bought that in the 60s 90 percent of my precision tooling is in the wooden box because i believe that my uh, the wood keeps it uh, uh your tools from rusting but there's a lot of good stuff in here too that won't fit in the wooden box now quickly if we go back to this slide i always like to say everything's an arm's length away from me well, if we stand here in the middle, it might not be an arm's length, but it's not more than a step or two away. So when I need to get something, it's just a matter of turning around and getting. If I need to check a dimension with my computer, if I need to put something in the machine, I, I can work this area basically two steps in any direction and pretty much do anything I want. And there's a lot to be said for this little U shape that I didn't uh, intentionally come up with that, but it sure works out really well for me. So. You might be surprised to know, and again, this isn't all about my tools tonight, but big switch from when I was a mold maker. The top drawer of my Kennedy, those are all my setup tools. Those are the, my wrenches. Um, I just got, I'll show you this in a little bit, but my deburring tools, my Allen wrenches, I use these all the time. When I was a mold maker, I used to keep my important stuff in the top drawer. I'll make it, and then going down from there. And then the last drawer was all my wrenches. And I'm like, well, now that I do this so often, it was immediately clear to me. Uh, swallow your ego, put your stuff you use every hour on the top drawer so you're not bending over all day. So that's just the way I do it, and that's what works for me. So that's about the only uh, drawer I'm going to open for you tonight. But that's all my setup tools. If you're just curious there, uh, I'll mention another thing too. I see a lot of guys, and I work at a machine shop now, not a tool shop, so it's a different mentality. Um, and a lot of guys have like a full set of ratchets and every size wrench and every size Allen, uh, Allen wrench is one thing, but screwdrivers, Phillips heads, this is it guys. This is my hand tools and these are my hand tools. And as you can see, the Allen wrenches, a few deburring tools. I think I have two screwdrivers. I don't use screwdrivers. I use like, I've got a couple of crescent wrenches, but I can pretty much do everything all day. Uh, and then the die bar does come in handy too. I'm probably the only guy that worked as a die bar because I was a mold maker, but every once in a while I use it. But that's it. So again, I don't believe in keeping a lot of junk and I try to keep that drawer as free as possible. So when I need something, I'm not searching through it. Now, you might not have a Mazak or maybe you're not even up to owning a CNC machine yet, but maybe you have a vertical mill of some sort or even a horizontal mill. But one of the things we do at our job is, is um, a lot, almost every machine we own, we've made subplates for the tables. And every inch and a half here is dowel, bolt, dowel, bolt. Uh, they're half 13s. And I remember I actually built these. That was a lot of drilling and tapping. Now, the beauty of this system is I've also pinned in both vices. Now, watch this. You say big deal, right? Well, there's a close up of the holes. And uh, again, the only problem with this whole setup is uh, 
these holes. You can see I try to keep set screws in the ones I'm not using, but sometimes you take them out for another setup. So about every three months, they try to go back in and fill up these holes, but they do get filled with chips. And when you blow them out, you know, it, it can get a little messy. And there's a lot of holes there. But the system, though, works wonderful for things like this. Now, if you look, you'll see right here, it says vices. Those holes are, are numbered. They're the, uh, the rows. Uh, let's see, the rows, the vertical up and down rows are numbered uh, uh, A to, I think, L. And then um, right to left, they're numbered with just numbers. So R, so the, my right vice is pinned in location H, H25 and H29. And my left vice, H11, H15. And my index head is an A2, G2. Now let's go back and look at that picture of that table. So those vices are in the same holes every time. These two vices, when you indicate them in, are usually within a thousandths. I can take those off and have those back on. Total time blowing out the holes and everything, five minutes. And they're always perfect. This index head, I use it once a month. I never even have to pick up the y-axis. It's always right there because it's pinned. If I put it in those same locations every time, my y-axis, my y pickup never changes. So a big time saver. I just have to touch up on the end of it, figure out where the top of the part is, and off I go. Big, again, time saver. So I would say the drawback of these these sub tables is the, the kind of a mess with the holes. But boy, you know, I, I'd probably be lost without them now. They really do come in handy. And again, I write these things down right on my machine. So anybody who comes over to run my machine or has to do something and takes those vices off, they'll know right where to put them back on. And again, there's the close-up of the holes. Then again, dial, uh, bolt, dial, bolt, dial, hole, table. It should have a part. Now, um, we all love Kurt vices, right? And I've got a couple of them on this machine, but the one on the right is my favorite one. And this is a Kurt D688 vice. And uh, I love this vice because of the, the opening on it. Uh, it's, it's truly, uh, I'm, I'm stunned at the work I can do on it. So let's look at the opening on this vice. Inside the, the jaws, I can get uh, almost nine inches. If I take those jaws out uh, and just use soft jaws, uh, the actual you know, the machine part of the jaws, um, almost just over 10 and a quarter. Then if I go across the top of the jaws, uh, 17 inches. So I can work on parts that are 17 inches wide, which, you know, and as long as I want, you know, as long as it catches my travel. Um, so my other vice doesn't open quite so far, so sometimes that, that's an issue, but I love this vice. And it's a, been a real asset to me, and I'd really be upset if I lost it or somebody stole it and put it on another machine, but I've had it for a long time. So again, 17 inches from here to here. Now you'll see I've made up a set of jaws for the ends of the vice. And um, I use about an inch and a half material here because now that we're clamping uh, above the actual jaws, because we're up here, uh, they'll, they'll want to flex a little bit. So I, I made these an inch and a half thick. So when I do have to work up here, uh, they're a little stronger. You don't have the same strength as you do down here when you're right, uh, right on the solid jaws, okay? What a couple questions here. Did you mill that subplate right onto the table? No, it's mounted, and I'll go back to that slide. It's bolted to the table with T-nuts, like you'd bolt anything to a, a, a solid table. So no, those, those tables are, are bolted onto the, uh, the actual Mazak table. Nothing's been machined into that. If, if we were to sell that machine and take those tables off, it would look just like a standard Mazak table uh, with T-slots in it. Um, did you mill this thing? What threads are in the table? Those are half 13 threads. And, you know, that's just the way we are in the States. We use, uh, we don't use metric threads very often. Spacing between the holes is an inch and a half either way. Every inch and a half on the X, every inch and a half on the Y. And every other hole is a dowel, a pin, or a bolt. All right. Uh, did you bolt it down and then mill it? No. Uh, what we did with that table was let me there's two there's two tables there they're they're split in the middle um the, we machined all the holes into it had it ground and then uh had it plated 
and then we just bolted it to the table, lined it up that way. Uh, let's see, and do I ever take it off? That was, that was put on about seven years ago, and it's never been taken off. And uh, there was a time I was kind of thinking about it after I got a face full of chips one day, but uh, it's, it's too valuable for me to do that now. How do you keep the T-slot table from rusting underneath it? Well, we're hoping and praying that the chrome plating on the on the uh, on the actual uh, sub table is helping with that. It is bolted down. There shouldn't be a lot of uh, stuff getting into that. The T-slots might be a little crummy underneath there. I would agree with that, but um, I don't think uh, they're really worried about it. You know, if they ever sold the machine. And they pulled the sub tables off. They just have to scrub them up pretty good. I'm sure you're right. They've been on there a long time. Uh, hope that answers your questions for now. And again, uh, for some reason, this chat. What, what type of steel did you make the tables from? I'm going to guess uh, those are made out of uh, something kind of tough, not hard. You don't want to make this. Everybody back in the mold industry, we made everything hard, rock hard. Well, when you bumped it with a cutter or you bumped it with a uh, drill or something, you broke the drill. I mean. And, I know you shouldn't do that, but things happen. We all agree with that, right? So I want to guess those were made out of 4140, um, pretty hard, 4140. So it's tough, uh, but it's not rock hard. So you, know, it, you can stone it up, and the chrome plating makes it nice, the flash chrome. Uh, it stones up beautifully. But, you know, if you look closely at the table, it's got some nicks in it. Let me explain this because you've been staring at it for five minutes. All that is is a 2 and 7 eighths high block. Now, what I use that for... It's as high as my vice jaws. And when I have to hang something way out, it's just another parallel. It's exactly the same height as my vice. Now, had I been thinking that day when I was in a hurry, I should have made two of them, but I didn't. So you probably could use two of those parallels that look like that, soft steel, uh, but that's two and seven eighths from here to here. And it just works as an extra extension of the height of your jaw. There's both curts are to both of mine are two and seven eighths, two point eight seven five from the table to the bottom of the jaw. Okay, let's go back to the Q&A now. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, all right, I'm gonna stay there for a second. Let's see if I open the Q&A again, if we have any more luck with the slides going to move. What we have here are Tool X jaws. That's the Tool X company. I think a few other companies make these. And the issue here is, uh, with, versus standard vice jaws, is they let you put in these snap-in parallels. And they come in all different sizes. I think the shortest you can get is a three quarter, and they go up to inch and three quarter. And the beauty of snap in jaws is first of all, you, as you can see, I have an Allen wrench in this top hole. And all that top hole does is when you, you just push these in and they snap in, and when you just turn your Allen wrench, I think it's uh, clockwise, it pops them right back out. Now, what's the deal with the snap in jaws? Well, it's funny. When I started here at ISM, I asked that same question. I, I like my own parallels, and I'll show you mine in a few minutes, but um, nobody could really answer the question because everybody just used them. Well, I learned out very, learned very quickly early on that when you're doing kind of machining work or production work, now I don't do a ton of heavy production work, but I don't even 10 parts. Uh, when you pull the part out and blow the vice jaws out, what happens? You blow your parallels away, right? Well, that doesn't happen anymore. So this is a little bit of an expensive setup, and I've got two vices with these setups, so I've got two complete sets of these parallels. But um, it is nice to when, you, when you're done with a part to open the vice jaw, blow it off, and you're ready to put another part in without wiping the parallels off or finding the one that flew off the table. Um, they're really, really nice. I've gotten used to them, and I, I use them 90% of the time. Let's go back. All right, so that's what it looks like there. There's a little uh, mechanism underneath the vice jaw. So I just did a close-up of that. And that's what the actual parallel looks like. And underneath the jaw, there's a couple spring-loaded grippers to grab that parallel and snap it in place. You know, I think those vice jaws cost mm, six or eight hundred dollars. And I don't even know. I'm gonna guess the parallels are probably hundred bucks a pair, but they're lifetime investment. And again, like I said at the beginning of the video or the beginning of the class, um, you're not gonna do all this overnight. Okay, I get that. But um, this is I, if I started my shop again tomorrow. That's the best way to put it. If I started another shop tomorrow, the stuff I'm showing you is the stuff I go out and buy right away. So that's how much I believe in these things I'm showing you tonight. And I'm the only guy that does this at work. Everybody just throws these in a drawer. Well, I just, again, to save time, 
I put little uh, bull, bull, uh, they call bulldog clamps, uh, like paper clips, uh, each around each pair. And um, they're always in match sets. Whenever I need them, I just reach in the drawer, and they're match sets. Anybody else's drawer, they're in a box, and they're all mixed together. So if you want a set of parallels, you got to go through every one. They find the two that match. We don't do that on my bench. They're all nice and neat, ready to go. And again, there's a lot of money sitting there in parallels, but uh, pretty cool. Just a little vice stop. And I probably have five different vice stops. So we'll go through them quickly. Um, this one I ended up at, at an auction, but what I thought was really cool about this one, you know, you go to the, you, you've got a hole in the side of your vice for a vice stop, and the curves don't come like that. So I've got a, I drill a hole in your side of my vice, quarter 20, but you're always losing the screw. Well, this is kind of neat. I took a, a screw and I turned it down, and the threads are just on the end. So when, when it's put together, the washer never comes off. So when you pull out your box, you're ready to go. It's always ready to go. So just a little tip there, but it's not a, not a huge thing, but I really like that, that I don't ever, ever have to look for a bolt or a washer. They stay together. I don't know if you've ever seen these before. I never saw um, these before I started with ISM. These just clip on your vice jaws, and there's two different sizes, and they're really handy little stops to use too. And again, just showing you what saves me time. I'll, I keep those right on in the open when I need them. They're ready to go. Uh, this is a stop I very rarely, rarely use. This is for my mold making days. This one actually bolts to the back of your curt vise, and the only reason those nuts are on there is to keep me from having to look for the bolts every time. So um, this, you can see, has a nut, uh, bolt back here, so you can slide this in and out this way. You can tip it up and back and forth that way, and then this bar slides in and out this way, and of course turns. So it's a very versatile stop. But, uh, uh, and, well, I call that my heavy duty stop because in the mold making business, a lot of my stuff is heavy. And I wanted to make sure when I pushed it up against the stop, nothing was going to move. And that, that stop will definitely take care of that. It's, it's a good stop. But my favorite stop are these swing away stops. And uh, never saw those before. Um, I've got a couple different versions. And um, basically, I'm going to show you how they work in just a second. They bolt right to my table. And the only thing I didn't like about this one, you can see a couple times somebody forgot to swing it out of the way before they took the cut. Okay, that's not what's supposed to happen, but even when you hit it, they just push away. But um, you can lock them down as tight as you want and use them as a permanent stop, but we usually we just firm them up just a little bit so they are um, uh, they move with some force, but you can swing them out of the way. The thing I did not like about this one is this threaded rod, which is time-consuming, to move this thing back and forth. Uh, I see I've got a few questions. Hang on just a second. That's another view from the other side. All right, so um, I believe at the tool and die guy .com, I have the drawing for that. So if you guys are members, just email me. Uh, I think I sketched that up. But I did make an improvement on it. I made a new end piece for it. And I put a 5 16 injector pin in with one set screw. Now I don't have to screw the rod in and out, and in and out every time I change it. One screw, and it just slides in and out. So what you're seeing, though, in this picture is uh, I actually have this piece of material in my vice jaw that I've got to mill all the way around it. Okay, and um, you can see I've got those snap-in jaws there, and I'm barely holding on to it. I'm holding on to that by about a hundred thousandths, and I will come right down to the top of that vice jaw, and walk right around that, and then I'll flip the part over and mill the excess off. So I can do a lot of profile work, but I'm going to hit that stop. So the next slide should show it swung away. So that's the stop in position. I know it looks like there's a gap there. There's actually a um, a cutout in the end of that pin, but if you look up here, you can see it is touching. So you push it up against the stop, tighten the vice jaw, swing the stop away. All right, so what we're gonna do is take just a quick break here and let me see what the questions are, which probably is gonna stall me out for a minute. I apologize, but uh, what do we have here? I just wanna make sure it says three questions. Let me see what we have here. No new questions. And you guys are all afraid to ask questions, unfortunately. But you know what? Uh, and I get that because we're slowing down the video. So here's what we'll do. At the end of this whole class, though, we are going to have a question and answer period. So take notes. And then because we won't be going through slides, and then we should be fine. Peace. All right. This is a new addition a few months ago. Uh, I was really sick of blowing out the, the areas in my vice. The, the chips just keep getting loaded up in there. But you, know, you can take a piece of sheet metal and just lay it over there. That's fine, too. But I got a hold of, we got a hold of Kurt, and they make these way covers or whatever, not way covers. They, they cover the groove, the screw area. And 
they just sell them in like 18 inch lengths and you cut them up. So I have a few different lengths. So when my jaw is all the way open, I can put it in between the jaws. And if it's almost all the way shut, I can just cut them with a, uh, with a saw. And they're, they're pretty hard. They're like a spring steel, but I used to cut off wheel. And uh, that's what it looks like inside the vice jaw and the vice. Doesn't that look a lot neater? I mean, back to this, chips in here all jammed up around your screw. Besides looking neater, it saves your vice a little bit and your chips blow away faster. Again, all of these are all little things, guys, that I explained at the beginning of the class. They all add up. So every time I'm done with a part, because uh, there's a lot of milling on this particular part, I just, when I blow it off, I'm not blowing things and under my vice, into my vice. It's much neater. And again, I, I like the way it looks. Came up with this a couple of years ago because my vice is so wide, standing there cranking it open and shut. I just took a three quarter inch socket and uh, made an adaptive for it so it fits in my electric grill so I can open my vice jaw, you know, the full width in like three seconds. And again, big deal, but it adds up. It's another thing, you know, your boss is standing there and he walks over the part that's huge, like 17 inches wide. Other guys are standing there cranking and cranking and cranking for two minutes. I'm opening you know, just a few seconds. And that's all it is. It's an old three quarter socket that I uh, took a piece of uh, half inch square stock, turned the end down round. And uh, I can't remember how I was able to get a set screw in there. It must have been just the right size. I was able to tap it to hold it in place. If it didn't, wasn't tapped, it would just come out all the time. So to tap the, the, the uh, set screw helps keep it in place. But again, little thing, but saves me time every day. And that's a new thing I got a couple months ago, a little speed handle. And I use that when I'm machining plastic. I, and I don't need a big vice handle. It keeps me from over, uh, uh, over uh, clamping the part and warping it. So these little speed handles, it was like $19. It's awesome. And, uh, um, and if, if I've only got to open the vice a couple of inches and that's on there, I won't get the electric grill. I'll just use that a lot faster than a standard handle and fairly inexpensive. Have you ever seen one of these? It's called a quad rollel, not a parallel, a quad rollel. And I think I got a couple of views of that, yeah. Um, basically, two hardened pieces of steel, uh, springs in between with a ball in the middle. And you can uh, really, this comes in handy. I've only shown it uh, opening the top and bottom. It can also go, um, how do I want to put this? Uh, it, it's a ball, so you can, you can make this end tight and this end open. You can make all, you can do a, a triangle with it. Um, I use it because we do a lot of weldments at work, and sometimes I put them in my vise, and because they weren't welded square, when I squeeze them, they tip up. Well, sometimes the quad rollel, <laughs> it's, I think it's like 100 bucks, um, it'll take up the crooked wall on the part, so the part clamps flat. So don't use it a lot, but man, when you need it, it's the coolest thing ever. I mean, it's shockingly um, versatile. It opens, I think that thing will tilt to about, gosh, it's gonna be eight to 10 degrees, so even as I remember a couple of years ago, they gave me a part with like 10 degrees on it. And I didn't know how to hold it. And I put the quadro in on the side on a fixed jaw and everything ran just fine. So it's a nice little tool. Now, we talked about parallels tonight. And these are my parallels. One of the first things we used to make when we were apprentices are our parallels. And those are, my, those are made of 01 hardened steel parallels. I learned how to grind. I learned how to deal with heat-treated stuff. It's a good lesson for me. Um, why do I still keep those? Well, I'm not going to get rid of them, number one. Number two, I they come in handy around the bench. Uh, I use them uh, for checking stuff on my surface plate. And um, when I want something perfectly flat in my mill, I'll use these. Not that the um, snap-in parallels aren't flat, but I don't know if my piece is all the way down. Because when you're one of the things you learn uh, – when you're squaring things up or working with a vice jaw, you put your parts into the vice jaw, you tighten the vice, and, and you hit it with a dead blow hammer. Well, the next thing, by instinct, we used to do is you know, lean in with your finger and you check the parallels. And if they move, you're not flat. Well, with the snap in parallels, I can't tell if they're all the way down or not. Most of the stuff I do, it's not that critical. When I want something perfectly flat, I go back to my old parallels and I put them in, and when I hit, strike the part with a dead blow hammer, I can reach in, and I, if the parallels don't move, I know I'm flat. Just that's the tool maker in me. Again, I don't use those too often anymore, but I keep them at work because they do come in handy. And that's a box of springs, and all the boxes die springs is for. I think those are leftovers actually from my tool and die shop. That's weird. But uh, 
I put them in between the parallels when they're in the vise uh, once in a while if I'm doing a production job and uh, that keeps them in place uh, so they don't blow away when I'm uh, um, again opening the vise jaw but then that kind of defeats the purpose of being able to feel the parallels with my fingers so I don't do that very often but there are rare cases so the box is dice man. there's no big deal there these come in handy these are parallels I made back in the day those are just little tiny little thin parallels and sometimes you just got to have them and there's a better view they're a sixteenth of an inch thick they're just made of pre-hardened uh, 01 I never hardened them and they work just fine I use them once a year but skinny parallels um, I think what you're going to, I probably would say to this, and I don't care uh, if you've been in the trade a while, you'll agree with me. If you're new in the trade, you can never have enough parallels. And that's the case with me. I have a lot of parallels. And uh, I've got a whole drawer full of smaller ones, but I'm not going to bore you with that tonight. Those are more for my grinding work. But uh, I have a lot of parallels. This is a, one of my latest additions. I use, I change vice jaws a lot. So we got an air ratchet. Pretty cool. I like the air ratchet. Uh, I got sick of using my Allen wrenches or my ratchet to take the jaws in and out of my hurt vise. And the reason I change vise jaws a lot is this. And if you remember this little die guy, you've probably seen these soft jaws. And for you guys who don't know what soft jaws are, back to my system and the things that saved me a lot of time. Soft jaws uh, are a great secret. You know, you got 10 parts to the machine and they're eight inches in diameter. Uh, you know, and maybe they're not hollow, so you can't put something through the middle. How are you going to hold them? So I'll grab a set of jaws, and I'll machine that the radius in them, and I'll put them in the machine. I'll put them in the machine, and I'll put one, two, three blocks or something in between my jaws, and I'll cut that radius in there, and now my parts just fit in perfectly every time. And I can't tell you how much time soft jaws save me. You can see there's one set here that I do, obviously, four parts at once. I, I got a, several round ones, and I started uh, writing the diameters on them. So if I get another part, I can tell, hey, that'll fit in there, or it won't. I know what these diameters are. You can see that's a 5.380 uh, diameter on this one right here. It's just uh, I love I use them all the time. And how much do I use soft jaws? I keep a spare set. Those are blanks under my bench, and those are ready to go. So soft jaws are just one by two. I'm sorry, one, yeah, one by two by six, cold roll. Cold rolls great. Don't need to be tough. Don't need to be hard. If you run into them, you don't break the tool. Yeah, you know, it just happens. But uh, let me see if we go back here. You can see some of these I've, I've made for production jobs. Look at this one. We run right through them. See, and they're soft. So I, I think on this one, I hold four parts in between one, two, three, four. I go right around the four parts. And again, I go right through the soft jaws. And this is cold roll. So I use them all the time. That's why I got the air ratchet, because I change jaws constantly. This might look familiar again to some guys who are members of the Soul like the Soul, the Soul and Die Guy. And these, uh, this is a subplate I built. And um, I love my subplate. And you're going to see uh, I use my subplate quite often. And um, that actually sits on the top of my Kurt vise. I use the outside uh, jaws to hold it in place. Um, this might be 4140, same pattern, half inch, uh, inch and a half spacings with in, half inch dowels and half inch, half 13 bolts. And let me show you a couple things before I'm done here. And I have the sizes on that. Um, I'll get those for you. I, uh, I do have that. Hold on. Now. Another view. Um, actually it was, I didn't like the, how flat my parts were coming out. So I took a cut over that with an end mill. Little tip for you: When I really want stuff flat, I use a carbide end mill versus a big fly mill. I, the fly mills or big carbide face mills, I feel like they kind of when they come off the part, they dip a couple thou. So, excuse me, <coughs> maybe, maybe it took a few more minutes to do it this way, but I know that's nice and flat now, and that's what it looks like underneath. Actually, that used to be my subplate, and then I got this one, so I just pulled the two together, so I have a little bit bigger subplate. That's just the way that worked out, and I'll get you the dimensions for that. Now, jacks. The jacks come in handy because when you put the subplate in your vise, it hangs out a little bit. So what I'll do is put some jacks under each end. Uh, you can't have enough jacks, and I didn't use any jacks when I was a toolmaker, but as a machinist, I use jacks every day, and um, those support the ends of the sub table when you put it in the vise. Because you'd be surprised at drill pressure. What that can do to you. Uh, I've actually seen my sub table go like that. It wasn't good. 
That was a bad day at work. So I'm going to take a quick break here. I see I've got uh, not break. I see I've got some chat comments. I know we're going to, we're going to stall out for a few seconds, but I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Okay, uh, and hopefully you guys can all see what they're posting here in the chat room. They're showing the speed handles. The uh, mic. Uh, let's see here. Let me just read this. It makes it worth my time. I don't know what everybody else is doing. Leave the chat open and you can see the comments. So Mike Kelly is being my assistant tonight. Thank you, Mike. Uh, he's putting in uh, links for the products I'm showing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, let's see, he has the Kurt pinned to the table. I don't think my Kurt has pinholes. It doesn't. So what you do is you flip your Kurt vice over and you put a bar of material. I, I use it on my other Kurt vice. I put a bar of material in my Kurt vise, my second one. I turned the first one upside down and clamped it to that. Now it's sitting there upside down, and I indicate it along the length of it to make sure it's sitting as flat as I can get it. Then I indicate the, uh, on the bottom of the Kurt vise, there's a, a large hole. And that is supposed to be the center of um, T-slot holes. So on the belt of the vise, where they would normally put keys in. So what I did is I just indicate that hole in it, and I came out six inches, three inches each way, and I put in my dowel pin holes, and I drilled them far as far as through as I could. They, they can't go all the way through because they run into the part of the vise, but you can get them enough of the way drilled through so you can pound them back out if you need to, because you know, blind dowels in a vise would probably not be good. Uh, let's see if we got anything else. So basically, we got some guys here. I appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, I don't know if this will all show up in the recorded version, but we shall see. Now, if I go to the next, nope. So we're gonna have a little break in the action here when I, as I stop the chat, and uh, we'll wait until the uh, chat disappears, and hopefully I'll be able to get to the next screen soon. So all I can do here, basically, gentlemen, is push my button, and my arrow buttons, and wait till it responds. So, and I think I'm gonna leave the chat and the Q and A again alone until I figure out what the problem is. But I don't feel like calling the company in the middle of my my class. It'll kick in in just a second. We've been through this a few times. It's frustrating for me to see you guys are asking questions up there and I can't answer them. And so I, I get tempted. I was tempted by you guys, but I had to answer the questions. And then look at what you did to me. You crashed my class. But I didn't know Mike was busy out there posting links, but that's very helpful. Very nice of you guys to do that. You know, I'd rather have you guys post the links anyways, because if I post them, um, you guys will repost anyways, and I found them cheaper somewhere. So it's always better if you guys just go ahead and do it. This one's taking a little longer than it needs to. There we go. Jeez. All right. What is that, you might ask? Another time saver. Okay. So picture our shop. 150 guys out there. Shoot. I think we've got 75 machines or something centers. A lot of mills. So depending on your skill level, you know, what they want to do is measure your tools for you. So we've got this $43,000 tool presetter. And when you go to the tool crib and get a tool or, you know, tell them what you need, they hand it to you with a sticker on it, given the length and diameter. Well, we can do better than that. So what I did was I had our lathe department and I gave them some dimensions. And I'm going to share those with you. This is just a piece of hot roll steel, painted blue. And if I take my digital height gauge, and set a zero on the top of that, right at my machine, and measure, I put my Cat 40 holder in there, and that ball mill is three inches, of, uh, 42 thousandths from the gauge line. If I take that up to the Parlec, the $43,000 machine, it reads the same thing. Talk about a time saver. I work about 300 steps from the toll crib, so I don't like to go up to the toll crib. So, uh, and if they're busy up there, and a lot of guys won't measure their own tools because they don't have this, and, so I don't know why they won't just give everybody what is in the shop. It's such a time saver. 
Uh, you'll get the video of this, and I actually, again, I believe it, uh, it's told by guy.com. This is included there, and there's, this is a PDF. But uh, you can freeze this video as long as you want when I give you the copy and get these dimensions. But that's just a standard Cat 40 taper, and um, I, I give you the instructions how to do it. So it's a three inch diameter round. And again, back to the little things. Me not having, or even when I go to the tool crib, she might be doing um, pulls for 10 guys. And they're like, it's going to be a half an hour. No big deal. I go grab an end mill, I put it in a holder, I go back to my machine, I mic it, I measure it with the tool crib presetter I built, and I'm done. I, I, I would say that thing saves me three hours a week. Just, just that uh, simple little um, thing. And I don't even have it hardened. It's just hot roll. But, and, it, and it repeats every day. Uh, the Parlec gets a little fussy and needs to be recalibrated, reset. Um, never this. Repeats every day. So, first thing I did when I took over this work area was I made this thing for the bolts. All the bolts, all the step clamps, everything was in a box or in a drawer. So I, I, I hate that. This took me a long time, a good 15 minutes to make. All my step clamps, all my um, my second, all my setup studs, nuts, and uh, hold downs right there. And then you can see it was an Allen wrench, and there's one of my little vice uh, jaws uh, stops right there. So that's right at my fingertips. Again, arm's length away. That's what I'm always trying to do is keep everything within an arm's length away. Counter sinks. Again, a little dusty there. I apologize. We do a lot of deburring. Um, but hunting for them. I don't have to hunt for counter sinks. Just drill, just take a minute and just drill some holes in a piece of two by four and you're done. It's it's just again, I don't have anything rolling around in drawers. I don't even that anal. I just like to have things where they should be. And it looks professional. I have this welder that comes down once every three months to drop something off. And he always stands in my work here. He says, this looks like a laboratory. And it is. I don't hunt for uh, my uh, torque wrenches either. Again, it takes two minutes. Funny story about the two by four. I had a, a trainee a couple years ago. And uh, he, was, he didn't know anything. That was his project. I don't want him to say his name. Joe. I said, Joe, it wasn't. No, it was, anyways, I said, make me that. And it, it took him a while. You can see he drilled this one through, but it works. And all my Torx wrenches, those are the ones I use all the time for the mostly for my end mills to change the inserts. Again, no, not rocket science. Little things keep adding up. Cutter rack. Um, again, I am very lucky that my company has a lot of tooling, but I would tell you that cutter rack hasn't changed for eight years. I'm not a hoarder. If I get too many tools and they won't fit on that rack, something's got to go. So I just make sure. And I build a lot of repeat jobs and a lot of repeat fixturing. So I've got a lot of tools that I use a lot. So they're all measured. You can see I use these yellow tags to write the lengths down. So all I have to do is plug in the length of my machine and go. And uh, again, you know, the, the, you might not be there yet, but to have a nice cutter rack next to your machining center or your bridge port or in your shop, that everything's tagged, marked, and ready to go. Huge time saver every day. And this is another thing I do. Uh, these are drills and taps. There's a quarter 20. There's a tap drill. There's a tap. 5 16 18, tap drill, tap. 3 8 3 8 16, tap drill, tap. Uh, and that's a uh, half 13, the drill, the tap. And if we go over here, I don't know if you guys know about jig bore reamers. That might be a voice from the past for some of you guys. Uh, jig bore reamers. Um, it says right there on the bottom, so I don't have to spell it for you. We use those a lot as bold bakers. And to see, I and I don't know, with everybody that's on the call tonight, so I, for, forgive me if I'm being redundant here. For everybody that's on the call, everybody you should know that even with the CNC machine, when you drill and ream a hole, it should come out on size but it might not be perfectly in the right location because if the drill blocks it all, the reamer's just gonna follow it. So a jig bore reamer works just like a reamer, except it'll follow, it won't follow the hole. It'll put the hole where it's supposed to be. So it's the same, you just use them like a reamer. Um, you drill your hole or you wanna drill your hole, and then you run these at the same speed, they come on size. So you're gonna get usually, uh, I mean, if it's a half inch jig bore reamer, it's gonna be pretty much a 500 diameter hole, unless you're running out at all. But they're great, and for fixture building and pinning things, um, I never use reamers. I use jig bore reamers. I just, again, same thing. Drill it like we're going to drill a 64th under for a reamed hole. 
but uh, these put the hole exactly where it needs to be. When I when I put my fixtures together, that stuff nobody's banging anything together. Everything just like that. So jig bore reamers is a good tip. Um, I wasn't going to show a lot of tooling tonight, but since I was taking pictures of the taps and how that saves me time, that's a little bonus tip for tonight. The Indicol. The Indicol. Now let's think about the Indicol. When did we use those? Well, back on the bridge ports, back in the day. I couldn't wait till I got my first Indicol because they were so toolmaker-y looking. You know, they're cool. They still have, that's the original box. I bought that in like 1981. And I thought when I got, you know, out of the CNC machines, they were done, but I would throw it out, you know, and there was no eBay, I was gonna sell it. So I've had it for years, and then I realized it fits right over most of my Cat 40 tooling. So there I am with my series of great lessons. See the sub table? That's on top. Now I didn't, uh, I've got a big ring, I've got to drill some holes in. So instead of having a, I've got a big tramming bar, but there's my Indicol right there. You can see I'm using two dowel pins in the sub table to locate the ring. And I'll end up putting a stud right in the middle, and there's my old Indicol being repurposed. Like I said, it fits right on a lot of my Cat 40 tooling and it gives me a nice wide reach to indicate this uh, ring in, and off we go. Okay, let's take a look at this picture. This is a gigantic tube that I built uh, a couple times a year. So of those ones when it shows up, you just roll your eyes. So you'd be like 25 of these to do. Two operations. What you can't see is this tube goes on and on and on and on down the left side of the table. But you can, what you can see is I've got it clamped out, uh, to some one, two, three blocks. Well, the only fallacy with this setup, see there's the pins in my table, so that's what keeps the tube straight. So it's up, rubbed up against these tubes, and then uh, it's pushed up against these pins. I'm sorry, the tube is pushed up against the pins, and I clamp over the one, two, three blocks. Well, the problem with this setup is what? When I unclamp, and I take the tube out, and I blow off the table or the one, two, three blocks, I blow the box off the table. You know, it's only 20 parts, but it's irritating. So we had to do something about that. So I took uh, four pieces of cobalt, one by two by three. You can see they're still just saw cut. Didn't touch them, didn't skim them, didn't grind them. They're just, they're all the same size, they're cobalt. And I just drilled and uh, counterboard them and I just pulled them to the table now. And uh, there you go, done. Never blow the blocks away again. It's just again, another little part of the system. But uh, I love showing you guys this stuff because that's, I ran that job the same way for three years, blowing the blocks around. It's like, whatever. And finally, I said, that's enough. So the, I use these all the time now. So I enjoy it, uh, having those. Big asset now when I run that job, but to blow my stuff off the table. Graphite. There's a, I have a box of graphite underneath my bench. What do I use graphite for? I use graphite to, uh, for tapered cutters. And what I do is I run a tapered cutter through my graphite. I take it up to the inspection department, and I look at the... Uh, I'll put it on the comparator and I measure across the bottom and now I know my tip diameter. And just a quick way to check your uh, paper cutters, which you ought to know about uh, the diameter. There you go, graphite it does check a little dirty, but uh, it's not like we're cutting an inch deep either. Um, that is a little more for precision. That is a, unless you've never seen one, that's a precision magnetic edge finder versus your standard edge finder. You, you, put, you uh, stick that to the side of your piece, but you really need it to be right on the money, and you find the center of this slot. You've probably seen those, but I thought I'd show you that. I like that. And then I use this a lot because um, I get a lot of pieces that are tapered, and I got to find the center, and um, at their flame cut. So they're flame cut with a taper on it. If you guys can see me talking, when you cut with a plasma machine, you, we call it kerf. In the mold industry, we call it draft. But so what I do is if I've got to find the center, you know, when you've we've got an angle and you've got a uh, an edge finder, let's see if you get my hands here right. <laughs> uh, trying to do it. You're not gonna your edge finder's not gonna hit it right. The ball on this will hit it right. So I just go down the same depth on both sides. Light turns green. I love this thing. Uh, my first complaint I have about these they barely give you any travel. You got about 15,000 each way, or you, you ruin it. If you bump into the shank, you're done. It, it's, it ruins the ball inside. It's just a mess. I've done it enough. That's why I know that. Uh, my, one of my favorite things in the world, my Mighty Mags. I use Mighty Mags for everything, and uh, I hook indicators to them all the time. Buy the real ones. They're cheap enough for a set. 
don't buy the Chinese ones, the magnets fall out. I've had those since, since 1980. I love my mighty mags. Um, I use them, I hang my aprons on them sometimes when I'm in a hurry. I will go up to guy's box once in a while. He's got to watch and get his indicator out. He gets his indicator out. Then he's got to get a stem out. Then he's got to get the, his holder out. And I say, God almighty, what's taking these people so long? This is a Sterrett number 58S uh, clamp. I love this clamp. I have two of them. It'll hook onto three different size um, uh, height gauge or magnetic where rods. I think we've got, I believe, um, I should have measured. I think we have three sixteenths, quarter, and three eighths. Now, what does that look like? There you go. This is a three eighths rod, so it's 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 already hooked to that. I could use two other size rod sizes, and then my indicator uh, fits in into this universal V on the end. Uh, and 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 because it opens up quite a bit, you can also put your quarter inch um, your plunger on the back. Your plunger indicator will fit. So that's sitting on my bench like that all the time. I'm always ready to go with my two indicators. I use this a lot for checking dimensions and checking flatness on setups. And uh, I use this a lot just because it's you know, my favorite indicator. Usually that one's not set up on a magnet, but there's my two 58S clamps that I've had for 40 years. I love them and they save me a lot of time. It's a Starrett number 58S. Got this a few years ago, digital protractor. So I think it's nice about this thing is um, you calibrate it to your machine. And so if your machine is just not quite level, you know, a quarter degree off, once you calibrate it and just use it on your same machine, it's accurate. And it's how accurate, not tool maker, mold maker accurate, but for some of the stuff I do, even if I'm going to put a sign bar on it, this gets me very, very close. And then I might check it with a sign bar, but I love that. So another small part of the system, but a great time saver. It's a Fowler mini mag, uh, it's called. So. And you can see it's got magnets on three sides. One, you can't see the ones in the bottom, on the side. So you can pretty much clamp this thing anywhere on your workpiece. I use it a lot. Okay, AutoCAD. Everybody should have a seat of AutoCAD. You know, um, you can get it for free. I've got a set, I've got AutoCAD at my house on this computer I'm using right now. Uh, it's free, I got the student version. It just says if you print anything, it says the student version on it. Well, I'm not printing anything. So. Having the ability to bring in drawings and make quick sketches of fixtures and everything, I might be preaching to the choir here. I get that. But if, if you own a shop or you're pretty good at what you do, if you own a shop, give your good guys a seat of AutoCAD. Uh, if you're, um, you know, this runs on an eight year old laptop too. It's not like it's you know, rocket science here. If you um, are a pretty good machinist or, or whatever, ask your boss for this setup. I can't tell you the amount of time it saves me. You know, whenever my designers give me something, they always forget a dimension. That's that's just human nature, right? They leave, I'm stuck. So they always send me at the AutoCAD drawing. Oh, they forgot the dimension of home. Oh, they forgot to put the length of the plate on. I bring it in, you know, off we go. And AutoCAD's pretty simple. Again, uh, I have several lessons of it, I think, believe, on the tool It's fun to teach. And I used to love drawing by hand, drafting, this little drafting table. But with AutoCAD, there's no erasing. You delete. Start period, it's much easier. Um, one other big addition is uh, this I got this several years ago. The company paid for this. Uh, I use this every day, and it's this 12 inch, uh, 12 inch digital height gauge. Very important part of my arsenal. Again, I use it all the time just for measuring cutters and you know, like the end mills, but I use it for a lot more than that. It's a huge time saver for me. And again, I, I can't tell you enough. These are the things I would buy if I started over again. And, and these are the things I would miss the most if they got damaged or stolen or taken away. That, that's what I'm showing you tonight. A couple of these uh, Milwaukee uh, uh, drill chucks, I mean, they're drill, electric drills. They're great to have around. I don't know how I ended up with two, but uh, it's nice because I can keep one set up uh, with my, for most times, with my little tool to open and close my vise. And usually the other one has a countersink in it. And if you even just buy one for each bench, get them an extra battery. Um, so one always is in the charger, ready to go. But I use those constantly, every every day. And uh, they're great for deburring the parts. And, uh, and these Milwaukee ones seem to last very well. Okay, what do we do here? We are stuck. Oh, there we go. Let me go back. Again, I told you this time it wasn't going to be about tools as much. I ended up with these a year ago. And uh, these are digital depth micrometers. Now, as a mold maker, 
I use depth micrometers all the time. And they're the hardest ones to read. They read kind of backwards. So you're constantly backing up to make sure where you were at. Was I reading 50 or 75? Am I reading 75 or zero? And all, I can tell you back in the days when we used to run EDM machines, we used to have to use our depth mics to center our electrodes on the piece. There was always 25 pounds of mistakes. Had I had these, uh, I, do I need another set of depth mics? I needed another set of depth mics. Like I uh, needed a hole in the head. But these are so beautiful. Now it gives me a total of three sets of depth mics. But if I were going to start all over again, I would start off with the digitals. Not all digital mics, but digital depth mics for sure, because they're a big time saver for sure. Uh, mistake saver too. And mistakes, I saw, uh, limiting mistakes, obviously eliminates wasting time, right? And I got these a few years ago because I had some work there giving me, and it was all on the, very tight. And I got sick of trying to read the vernier. I know how to do it on my, on my, my trusty stare at the ones. Now what the hell? So I, I went out and bought, I bought these digital mics and they read out to like 50 notes and uh, I love them. They're really nice. I don't use them that often. I just, they're kind of big for out the ones. Um, but I, when I do need to really check something and it's with intents, I trust these. They're, they're excellent. But again, kind of a confidence builder. Uh, confidence saves time because the person's not doubting themselves and they can, I like, again, I said I'd show you things I really would not like to be without. And that's really one of them too. Okay, pet peeve of I. I go up to get I ask, can I buy your mics? Or I watch a guy go to get his mics out. Well, at first, he can't remember what drawer they're in. Then he finally finds a drawer. Then they're still in the original box. Then he opens the box, and he, you know, then he's got his mics. My pet peeve is this. Your mics, uh, if you have a box like this, or even, even when I had, didn't have my wooden one at work, and I had my Kennedy, I would just leave my mics open like that. It's to me, they're ready to go. I used to keep them on a rubber mat in my care at my Kennedy. Now they're in a nice green drawer. When the QC department comes up for calibration for an ISO audit, and they say, We need your mics, I hand them the drawer. And they're all in one spot, nice and neat. Uh, I, I keep the original boxes. I, I shouldn't say that. I think I have the original box for that. I mean, some of these are really old, but um, in case you would ever sell it, they have the collectibles would want the box. I, 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 I say, just lay them on rubber mats. They're not going to roll around. And then when you open it, there they are, ready to go. I'm the, I, one of the greatest filmmakers I ever saw. That's how he kept his mics, and I agreed with that. That's how I got in that habit. Got this just a few days ago. You got you got to believe this one. I'm checking some O-rings, and the guy that works opposite me, second shift sometimes, he drags out this thing. So what's that? He, he shows me, and it's like a digital depth mic. It's just a spring-loaded plunger, right? So I said, oh, that's kind of fun. I looked it up online. I got this for $13.95 at Global Industries. And it's really repeats beautifully. Uh, it's called a Fowler X tread. It's for mechanics that tech, check the treads on your tires for inspection. And it's and uh, it's plastic down here. But what are you going to rub rubbing against? It repeats unbelievable. And it reads the half thousands for $13.95. I'm guilty. I'm a full junkie. I had to buy it. So again, for tool making, different story. Production work, you know, you got to check a lot of stuff. Please repeat, and then they're easy to read. What did I want to show you here? That big ring. Oh, here's the big one for you. Okay. Most guys, they probably put a clamp here, a clamp here, and a clamp here, and then what would happen? You know, you have to probably do I crush this little ring, this O ring groove, the inside of it? What we do is the big C washer. And I've got a lot of big sea washers. And I, we have a plasma machine. I just give them the dimensions. And now I'm going to draw holes all the way around there. I have one nut. I just let loosen that nut, slide the, tea, uh, slide the sea washer off. I'm set up in minutes. Nice, even pressure all the way down. No nicks in the part. Sea washers. And let me show you. i got a lot of sea washers. That one's uh, nine, almost 10 inches diameter. That one's nine. That one's six and a half. Another full shelf of them. I think we start with. Two inch, two and a half, three, four. I've just got this collection of sea washers. Huge time saver. Good pressure down on the part, depending on what you're doing. And let's think about this. Even if I was going to mill, uh, which could put a little more side pressure on it, let's face it. When I learned to trade, it was all about taking big, huge, heavy cuts with heavy end mills. Well, the CNC machines, unless you buy a Morishiki or something like that today, they don't take big cuts. They take light cuts, fast cuts. 
So you're not going to move apart. And uh, and they're just a lot faster. I really love that. So there's one for you, sea washers. Look them up online. I hope you have uh, access to a, a plasma machine. If you don't, send me, uh, if you need some, let me know. I'll get your price from, from the place I work at. I'm surprised nobody sells them. <sighs> Old way of doing things that I used to do things, the step blocks. And the step blocks are cool, but you're going to be a mold maker and you're going to have a big core block, a cavity block in your machine and you're going to just clamp it down and you're going to use these uh, hold downs and shit parts going to be on there for a couple days or a couple weeks. No problem. When you're doing machining work, we all know what happens with these things, right? You loosen the clamps, take out the clamps, fall, the, the step blocks fall apart. So what I do is a little different system. I made up some of these U clamps, and you can buy these too. And uh, that way the clamp just slides off and on. I just loosen the nut, slides off and on. And I don't use step blocks in whatever I can. I use either j jacks or screws with nuts, and it's just as good. Uh, those those, those um, hold downs. Will, will sit just fine on, on screws like that. No no sweat whatsoever. I use these all the time. That way my stuff isn't falling down. I hate step blocks anymore. Um, I get it. I use them for a long time. Finally, we're going to get towards the end here. Your reference material. You know, I see guys open their drawers of their toolbox or I look at their bench and there's stuff with coffee stains on it and they're all crumpled up and I say, hey, where's this sheet at with this dimensions on it? And they get it out and it's... It's a mess. So the stuff I use all the time, I laminate. And that way it's nice and clean and it's ready to go and I can read it and I never have to get it again. So laminate your most important reference materials and you're done. And then this is an old box, very similar. It's a memory box actually for me. Every mold maker where I apprenticed had one of these on the end of their bench and that's where they kept their drawings. Well, you know, we don't do as many drawings as we used to, but I use mine. I built that years ago. It's a quarter inch, quarter inch plywood uh, to keep all my drawings and my reference materials in. There they are right there at my fingertips. I don't have to look for stuff. So, again, that's the theme tonight. Magnets, little magnets. I love magnets. And you just go to the hardware store for 10 bucks. That's a five year supply. And uh, right by my machine, I keep uh, a magnet here holding a piece of paper down, picking up the, uh, the, the cutter on the Z height sometimes. And if I really want to get close or check something, I've got a thou and a half shim stock there. Just magnet keeps them right where I want them. Don't have to look for anything. Again, you probably all have one of these. Trick is, like, I try to keep this at a minimum. I, this is so old, I'm missing four drawers. And But this is what I do. Um, not a lot here. 1032 and 316s, pins and bolts, quarter pins and bolts, 516s, 3.8s, and 716s, pins and bolts. I just need to check this up, whole size or a thread quickly. I've got the stuff, and there's nuts in there too. Again, not a big collection, but you know, and then it grows. You get too many drawers in, you get so much stuff. Um, these are aluminum shims too that I use to protect my parts. When you're going to use the uh, hold downs, so you don't put big marks marks in your parts. But everything's organized. I know right where it is. Here's a little thing I didn't know. How many of you guys ever tried to uh, put countersinks on the CNC? I've never had good luck with countersinks on the CNC machines. They seem to be working on manual machines like bridge ports because you can feel the countersink going down. Well, occasionally, you know, I get an order for uh, parts that have, that have 82 degree countersinks on it. Well, they do make these spotting grills that are 82 degrees. And uh, there you go. And the best part is there's, you know, I've got a tag, there's a length, and I've also got a chart for you for your different um, screw sizes. That's how far down you drill and you'll get the right size countersink. So pretty cool. That's a little thing I came up with a couple of years ago. I didn't know they made 82 degrees spotting drills, and uh, you're done. They, they were, can they come out really close? So that's a little part of my system also. And I think I threw this as, as a bonus for you guys with bridge ports. Built these a, year, a long time ago. These are exactly nine inches wide. That's the size of a bridge port table. These are spaced the width of your T slots, and these bolt right to your table. So. You don't push, when you're pushing a block on your machine, you don't push the parallels right off because I know you guys, we used to always overload our bridge ports. So those bolt right to a bridge port table. So that's a little tip for your bridge port guys. And finally, to add to your wish list. And uh, I screamed, moaned, cried, prayed until they got me an overhead crane. This is an interesting one. Uh, most people think probably the cheapest thing to do is to get a, like a, um, a jib crane because there's one pole in that. But they tend to, they're weird. I've had them, they bounce, they swing away. This is a little bridge crane. 
And I think it costs about $3,000 in the and it's a 500 pound capacity and a little 500 pound crane. The bridge is really nice. And uh, I, I thought I'd write that and show you that. That's the name of the company. And look at that. It's bolted right to the beams on the roof. That's what it's designed to do. The struts under our uh, uh, roof on our shop. And our roof doesn't leak. Everything's fine. You can see right there, there's a part of a nut and a stud going through. And I've got this like 20 foot wide by 30 foot span. And for the work I do, it's a beautiful thing. And of course, you have a bridge crane, you got a hoist, and then you get a little magnet. And you know, the big thing is if you're going to pin your vices to your table too, in a crane really helps to pick those things straight up and down or you're going to be trying to pry them off. So I just thought of that today when I was uh, doing it. So that's a little 300-pound magnet from Erie's Magnetics uh, located here in Erie, PA. I think that was a couple hundred bucks. And I'm really reaching here, but on your wish list, if you're never going to get a CNC machine. When I own CNC machines, I was never lucky enough to get one with this ship conveyors. These run all the time. We have a guy that's trained to come over and look, make sure hoppers aren't full. If they are, he takes them away. And never do I ever have to dig under my machine. That's a benefit to working where I do. I never have to pull out that tray, dig out the chips, push it back in. It never goes in right, and it leaks. And you don't know it's leaking because it's leaking slowly. So, uh, you know, two days of leaking, then it comes flooding out, and you've got two days of water under there. So the chip conveyor is a huge deal. So I think that might be the end. We are done. Question and answer period begins. Hope you're all still there. So um, I'm going to go to Q and A mode, and I don't care now if the thing freezes because that's it for the slides. So fire away, you guys. Um, whatever you got, I'm here. I'll stick around as long as you want. I also see I've got a lot of chats here. Let's we'll see if that is. This is. Uh, yep, yeah, I can see we're still getting links here. Mike Kelly, Mike Kelly's the man. Mike Kelly's not even watching this class. He is just being my salesman out there. Awesome. So um, it is on the East Coast, almost 8.15. So we went um, about an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, uh, let's see, Avery Roy, jig bore reamers. Perhaps another common name for those, they're called jig bore reamers. They're made by the Weldon Tool Company. Um, I think they're fairly hard to get anymore, but you can get them. Mine are not, they're not new, but they're only a couple of years old. And sometimes they take a little uh, time to get, but uh, uh, start putting your collection together. They're pretty cool. And they're, I mean, that set on my bench that uh, you saw, it's been there at least five years. I think I've had the half inch one sharpened once. Uh, and they're really simple to sharpen. They sharpen the end of it. And um, that's because I build a lot of fixtures with half 13s in them and uh, or ha and half inch uh, dowel pins. So that fun finally got done. Thickness of subplates for the vise. Um, they're one inch. They're right around one inch. Um, the uh, And they're probably just a hair under because they've been ground or machined or whatever. So yeah, we just saw one inch stock on, the, uh, on that. So. I'm seeing answer live here. Just question. We'd like to answer this question live. Um, Avery, when I, I saw that answer, did you hear that? Could you just let me know that you did hear that answer to that question about the jig bore reamers? I want to make sure I'm answering your questions. Uh, back in the chat here, what do we have? Uh, yes, the message about answering the wives. Okay. Okay. Uh, Bill Hannaway, thickness of the sub places. I, I answered that. Um, I see you paint your precision tools you make with, uh, with uh, one, two, three blocks. I use enamel. I just use a, I try to go to the hardware store and get like a, a brush on, uh, rust -oleum. It's oil based. And uh, that's all they do. And that's a, a totally a vanity thing. You don't have to do it, but you, you, they sure look nice, don't they? Uh, it makes your tools look really great. So I've always enjoyed putting a little uh, old school look to my tools, and that's the paint. Uh -uh. Let's see here. This is from John. So you can go all day and never write or edit G code. Do you have other software besides AutoCAD? Okay, good question. John. You're going to freak out. You ready for this? I know zero G code. None. I can't, I couldn't write a line. I'm a maze troll guy. Uh, my boss always tells me that 
uh, without a doubt, I am the premier example of what you can do with a Mazak with no programming experience. And I, I bat I have home runs all day with, in, with Maze Control. And uh, that's because of the work I do, though. I do a lot of onesies, twosies. And Mazak used to have a tagline that was, nobody gets the first done part done faster than Mazak. And they were probably right. Line in, line out, line left. I mean, it, it's so easy. I mean, seriously, it was the toolmaker's best friend. I didn't, at that time, I had spent all this time learning mold making. And once I figured out the Maze Act, it was just, it was like having an extension of my creativity. So that's what you paid more for back then. Technology was amazing, and it still is. Um, they've changed very little. So I, I could not write any G code. It's all done with the Maze Act. Uh, how much clearance for the dowel pin holes on the subplates? Um, you know, I, I, I like them to be, um, so I'm going to make sure. How much clearance the dowel pins? Uh, I, I like them to be a slip fit because if they're too uh, loose when I put them in there, used for locators, they'll fall through. So um, yeah, and they'll read all the way through. So they'll, they'll they will fall through. Uh, Coleman asked, I think spiral reamers are the same as jig bore reamers. I don't know that. Uh, you could look, but a spiral reamer is an end cutting like a jig bore reamer. Jig bore reamers are meant to act like an almost like an end mill. Um, so they're really much different than a reamer. They are, they're stout and they will put the hole where it's supposed to be. I can't, I cannot confirm uh, the, your your statement on spiral reamers. Uh, Tom, I use flood coolant on my mill. Do you have any tips for preventing rust under a vise? How do you keep the vice itself from rusting? Well, the reality is, uh, Tom, I'm not sure if you're talking about a CNC mill or if it's a, just a bridge port. If you're, what I used to do, um, and I still try to, but yeah, my, my table, my tables have been uh, plated. So if I get any rust, it actually wipes off of the rag. It's, it's just like, it, it looks, it's not even rust. It's, um, you know, it's, it was trying to rust, but it can't because it's plated. So that's one thing that stops it from happening. Um, number two, you could spray some stuff underneath before you put your vice down. I don't know if you ever tried that. Um, and number three, um, if you're getting a lot of excess rusting, your your coolant might not be mixed quite right. That shouldn't be happening. But you know, some of those bridge pour tables they're pretty much cast iron. I get it. So um, keeping them lubed up and sprayed with something uh, would probably help a lot. Um, but that's the best uh, advice I can give you on that. Uh, I'm still here. Well, uh, anything else, you guys? And did everybody get the answers, Tom? Did you hear the answer to what I asked about your coolant? You got we're good there. I just want to make sure that I'm seeing these questions and just answering them as we're talking here. Uh, just let me know that uh, you guys are hearing these the answers. Oh, Coleman, you had to hit me with this, huh? Uh, where do you see our industry in 10 years? Uh, I don't, I, I, I don't, I, I guess my question is the industry will probably still be here. I don't know if there's gonna be any money to be made. Um, I don't know, uh, except for rare people that, you know, the, the people that are doing the work or getting to work in the companies, they're being beat up. So, you know, then they get panicky instead of saying, let's, why don't we hire three fills and pay them well? They say, no, no, let's hire 10, you know, I don't want to say the wrong name here, you know, Eddie's and, and pay him 10 bucks an hour and we'll get 10 times work done. Not true. But they're, they're, they're conditioned, I think, a lot of the owners to uh, keep the labor rates down and they think that works. But in the reality, the right people that are paid right and ambitious and quick, uh, they'll make you more money, in my opinion. So the question is, I don't think this will be a very profitable profitable trade in 10 years for many, many people. Uh, maybe a few guys, but uh, I would recommend my kids get into it. I mean, really, that's the sad truth, and that's hard for me to say. Okay, Tom, yes, I'm using whey oil under my vice. Did you try, and I bet you, whey oil is pretty heavy duty. Did you try anything else, like a rust prohibitive or something like that, Tom? That actually might that work too, um, but that's all I can tell you. I'm sorry. That's the best advice I can give you on that one. And not to be a downer, Coleman. I hope the industry does come back. I really do. I wish it would. And, uh, uh, but I don't know. So, uh, listen, we had a few delays tonight. 
because of some issues. They weren't horrible, but I apologize for those. Uh, I am open to new classes like this. So if you guys have any suggestions, please email me. The email's on my site, um, uh, tollandieguy.com. If you want to write it down, it's all one word, Phil Kerner at gmail.com. 